For a reaction to the story, we're happy to be welcomed by Bob Bianchi, criminal defense attorney and partner at the Bianchi Law Group. Uh, Bob, thanks for coming on today. Uh, as Sarah was laying out for us, Smollett maintained that the crime he's accused of orchestrating, he says, was not a hoax. If you could uh, weigh in on the decision for him to testify, and was it convincing? Well, as a former prosecutor, a homicide prosecutor, I used to be like a lion in a cage waiting for a defendant to testify because, as my mentors used to tell me, and it's true, uh, the juries love to convict from the mouth of the defendant themselves. So they are going to focus very deeply into this case. The decision to testify is a very intimate one with a defendant. And many times as a criminal defense attorney, you don't think the state's case went in well and you advise the client not to testify. But many have the either ego or desire, and it's their right to reject their attorney's advice and get on the stand. And that's what Jussie Smollett has done. The question becomes, how well will he do on the stand? He's got a lot of ground to cover, Emma. He's got situations where he's got text messages that are out there where they want, he wants to speak with these two brothers on the low about something. And yet he's trying to say they really weren't my friends. These two brothers testified consistently with one another with regard to the conspiracy. He's giving them $3,500, which he now claims was for gym fees, and another $100, which the brothers say, no, that wasn't for gym fees. That's because he wanted us to execute this hoax, and $100 were for the supplies. And moreover, what I found very interesting at Wood as a prosecutor, and what if I were evaluating this case, is that you have this, this death threat that's made against you, and the uh, company is willing to give you off-site security, and you deny that. Now, I've had death threats made against me, and I'm a pretty tough guy, but I don't deny security when something like that happens. And then lastly, he just happens to be wandering around the street in the middle of a polar vortex that was going on very cold to get a sandwich by himself. And it just so happens, coincidentally, these two brothers just happen to know that he'd be there at that place at that time. Uh, so it just sounds to me to be extremely suspicious, and he's got a lot of ground to cover to try to explain all of that, and um, I think he's got a tough road to hoe here, but in the end, it comes down to the jury yeah. and whether they find the brothers were credible or whether Smollett is credible, but the prosecutor also has receipts, literally, with respect to things that support what the brothers said. And as you were pointing out, the brothers spent hours in court telling the jury how the actor had paid them to carry out the fake racist and anti-gay attack against Smollett in Chicago in January back of 2019. We're still talking about this case, obviously. Uh, the prosecution, though, is going to cross-examine him today. What are you looking for specifically? Well, a good cross-examiner as a prosecutor is going to make sure that they don't get themselves into any trouble, but the prosecutor has a lot of information, much of which I just spoke to you right now, and he's going to drill down on those issues. When you cross-examine a guy like this, you're also speaking to the jury as well when you're asking the question. Sometimes you don't even care what the answer of the witness on the witness stand is. So he's going to say, so $3,500 because you were going to have a gym thing? Oh, what's this text message? He's not your friend. And he didn't like you, but nevertheless, you're asking him to do something on the low. Oh, the low is about drugs? Well, how about, uh, you know, the idea that these guys wind up there? And can you explain why they'd be there that day, knowing that in the middle of a storm where it's so cold that you'd be at that location? Can you explain that, sir? So a lot of times on cross-examination, irrespective of what the witness answers as the question, a good cross-examiner is really communicating through his questions to the jury how absurd the testimony is. So uh, the prosecutor's going to have a pretty easy uh, day here. I'm looking forward to seeing what they do. And again, really quick, Bob, what's he facing here uh, should the jury reach a decision? Well, he's, he's facing minimal time here in the end analysis. You know, it's three years maximum. He's a first offender. It's likely he'd probably get a probation or maybe some county jail time for the judge to say that this just cannot be condoned. But we have to separate the idea that what Kim Fox did with this case in the beginning, which I was completely outraged mm -hmm. having run a prosecutor's office, the manner in which she acted in this case. We have to separate that from the actual facts of this particular case. But if it were me as a judge and I had the opportunity of hitting him with a little jail time, just to make the point that you cannot have a community go on fire, create racist uh, issues that don't exist. We have enough problems with that already, and legitimate victims have been marginalized because of this, and the police department expended tremendous resources. If I had the opportunity to judge, even though it may be a light sentence, I'd give them a little hit as far as some jail time to make the point. All right. We'll wait and see what the judge decides and, of course, what the jury decides as well. Bob Bianchi, thanks so much for weighing in on this case. My pleasure.